Hello there and welcome. We are so glad that you're here today. It's another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Our Ask and Answer is the episode that culminates the end of the week, and it really helps us set the charge for the weekend as we hopefully rest and relax for a brand new week coming up ahead for all of us. Do you want to honor and give a shout out of gratitude to Fundraising Academy at National University for allowing us these opportunities uh, to provide the Ask and Answer episodes? We always have a representative from Fundraising Academy, and today we have one of my personal favorites, Muhi Kwaja, joining us. Muhi is a trainer at Fundraising Academy, and he's also the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. He's been on several times and always brings, you know, his A-game with a lot of uh, skilled expertise and experience in our sector. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and I will say Fridays are one of my favorite. The questions that come in, the opportunity to talk, and as I said to you earlier, Muhi, like, I think we'll riff off a couple of these, right? Because we've got, between the two of us, we should probably combine our years of experience, but we've got some some great experience between us, and I'm really looking forward to these um, to these questions today. But before we dive into the questions, I do want to remind our viewers and our listeners that we have an an amazing team that supports these episodes. So day in, day out, uh, marching towards 800 episodes. So I want to say thank you so very much to our presenting sponsors that include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, where I guess Mookie joins us from today. Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. So these companies, as I mentioned, many have been with us from the very beginning, which was March of 2020. So uh, this month actually, you know, recognizes three years of broadcasting for these episodes and many, many amazing guests. And I just really feel honored to be alongside here. Most of our episodes, if not all of our episodes, are on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. They're also on the podcast platform. So wherever you stream your podcast, you can download and listen to The Nonprofit Show. We hope that you give us thumbs up and reviews there as well. Uh, That would always be great to have. So before we jump into this question from Robert, I do want to give you the opportunity, Muhi, to please share us a little, share with us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your role at Fundraising Academy, and maybe if we're so lucky where you're joining us from today. Oh, definitely. You're too kind. Thank you for the illustrious welcome. Um, So I started my career back in 2009 after graduating from the University of Michigan and stumbled into development through their summer internship program and was really fortunate to have a lens through the university to see how the alumni, how the hospital, how the athletics department and everyone in between helped raise billions of dollars for the university. Uh, And it really was an eye-opening career opportunity for me and having switched from um, mechanical engineering of all majors to history and psychology, I had no clue what I wanted to do. So I was very fortunate for that DSIP internship and it led me on this 14 year journey now. So um, I've been a one person development person, I've been a chief development officer, I've been an individual major gifts officer, everything in between from events to grants to um, everything nonprofit people have to deal with. So happy to share this journey with you and whatever, uh, answers I come up with, hopefully you find them helpful. Uh, and I'm joining today from Jakarta, Indonesia. So my current role, uh, at, uh, as a trainer at fundraising Academy, uh, is remote. Um, so I get to enjoy the flexibility of logging in wherever I can, whenever I can, uh, and honored to be here today with you. Thank you. It's so fantastic to hear about your journey, but I also think to have you show up and to model the remote, you know, living and workplace in today's date is so inspiring and reality as well, because as we know, many of our teams, many of our nonprofit teams across the nation are working with remote uh, workforces and staff. And so it's really cool to have you model that here for the nonprofit show. 
So, okay, we're going to dive deep into these questions. I believe we have four for today's ask and answer. And the first one comes to us from Robert, city and name withheld. Um, and I'm going to start it off by reading it aloud, toss it to you, Muhi, and then we'll see if I have anything to add, but you're usually pretty good at those slam dunks. So, okay, Robert wants to know, while we are based in a large American city, our board wants our development team to start working in a rural and regional parts of our state. We work in the Midwest and could have a larger donor footprint. What are your thoughts on this? Take it away, yeah, my friend. This is a really great question. And I think, you know, it's, of course, mission dependent. I think if the beneficiaries are people in these rural and um, other area, local areas, um, you know, do you have board members that are reflective of those communities? Do you have um, some donors who can introduce you? What's the in? Um, and would this expectation fall on the current employees or is the organization willing to hire somebody local from those rural areas to be a donor uh, manager for them? So a few questions that come to my mind um, and around the workload, making sure that it's something that can be managed uh, based on the current structure of the organization. You know, one thing that stuck stood out to me on this question was, you know, they mentioned that the development team was asked to go rural, but I didn't hear that the programming was going rural, right? And so that might be a bit of a disconnect, but there could be, as you were uh, saying, Muhi, you know, there could be a, an immediate champion in that rural vicinity that could absolutely, you know, wave the flag of this mission and really start to galvanize support perhaps in those, you know, uh, more remote areas. And so I love that you brought up like, is this an existing person? Will this be a new person? Maybe Robert, something to think of this is that it is an established person within that rural and that regional part of the state. I know that many national teams, you know, will create, um, regional offices, if you will, or like certain geographic areas to expand their footprint, as you mentioned here. So, you know, one thing that I know we've seen over the last three years, Muhi, is the the net that we as nonprofits have casted to our supporters has gone far and wide, right? Because of what you're demonstrating uh, as well, is that remote connection. You know, it's not, it's no longer this is only uh, supportive or for the individuals right here in our backyard, many people can either, you know, maybe participate in the programming, but so many people can be a part of the fundraising and the financial support. So Robert, we hope this is helpful in the Midwest. Uh, you know, it's, it could be a, a big task for you, but I think you're up for it. We'd love to hear back on um, how this manifests forward for you. So good luck. All right. We've got a lot of long questions this week, so we're going to get through them. But this one comes from, it looks like uh, the entire group of boards, so the board members of a Dallas, Texas organization. And they want to know, does it impact a donor's sense of our nonprofit stability when a new CEO is announced? We have had a long-term founding CEO replaced by a new CEO who only lasted two years. We have a new CEO coming in who we think will be amazing. Should we keep the new CEO leadership somewhat quiet during the transition or should we really promote it? Ooh, this is a really good question. I can't wait to hear your response, Muhi. Yeah, you know, think of the incoming CEO, like what is the best welcome for them? If you really think they're gonna be amazing, um, try to promote it in that way and share your excitement. Uh, I think that um, a unity, stronger front, uh, presenting it with the board support makes it a much smoother transition. Um, two years, you know, lasted only two years. I, I wonder why they frame it that way. Um, I think two years should be uh, celebrated. Um, you know, it could be, could have been challenges, but, you know, you have to take some wins out of situations, even if they're difficult. 
um, and understand that, you know, maybe the workforce isn't as career centric as the founder was, and that was their passion and their baby. So they were able to stick with it for that long. Um, but, you know, I've seen a lot of people take other positions because it helps them increase their salary. Um, I've seen people leave jobs that they love because of things like being able to go remote. Um, so there's a lot of different factors in uh, these that just adjust to the lifestyle uh, that we're living. So I would say embrace the CEO, support them. Uh, donors understand these transitions. Um, and if the donors have confidence in the mission of the organization, um, a turnover in leadership can be alarming. But if it's coming with, uh, I would be more alarmed if I didn't see an announcement from the board than if there was one. So, you know, that's exactly what I'm, yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. And, you know, nonprofits, we, we should come from a place of transparency, you know, not only financials, but talking about transition as well. And so I think if we didn't announce this transition, as you mentioned, it could actually bring more concern to the supporter group um, because there was no announcement, right? So I think that could be a piece of it. Um, Mui, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and I know it's not quite the same situation, um, but you moved from an executive director role into, um, you know, a, another role, and you brought in, if I'm recalling correctly, um, an executive director for the American Muslim uh, Foundation. Could you share with us, you know, how that transition happened? Because I'm curious and and really around the communication, because I'm curious if your personal story might shed some light on this for our, our boards. Yeah, sure. Happy to share a little bit more about American Muslim Community Foundation. Um, as a co-founder, I was full time uh, and realized that after doing that for two years, uh, I kind of burnt myself out um, and I was able to take a step back, go part-time with AMCF, and hire an executive director, hire a nonprofit manager, hire a donor manager, uh, and really create a team where I was doing all of those things in my own capacity, but I decided to take a pay cut uh, and bring on other people to help us really scale uh, and implement processes and bring in other people where my skill set was really strate strategy um, donor relations, fundraising, um, and these other people brought in their skill sets to really ramp up the organization. So I wanted to avoid being an organization with founderitis, right? Somebody who's just there. And um, I wanted to really expand the team and allow us to grow. Uh, so that was a decision that I made with the support of the board. Um, and you know, we've had challenges along the way and trying to figure out a good balance. Um, so even with a thoughtful transition, there will always be challenges that come up and arise. But I think that um, the the way in which it was communicated with our stakeholders um, was one that's continuing to tell our story of, of how we're growing and transitioning and being more grassroots and uh, growing together with our client base. Yeah. Thank you. I know I put you on the spot, but I love when you share that story because it is personal, but you know, it's really just so telling for how this transition is strategic. And, you know, what I would like to add to this as well is yes, let's celebrate those two years, as you mentioned, because the, the leader, the CEO for those two years could have come in for where you were as an organization in your life cycle, so critically pointed for those two years, moved you to a new direction or in a new space of the life cycle, and now you're ready for a different type of leader or a different kind of focus leader. So I'm right on uh, the page with you, Muhi. Let's, you know, let's not say only lasted two years. Let's really celebrate that two-year leadership. Um, because that in and of itself is strategic. And now it's time to take another strategic uh, move, if you will. So I hope that's helpful. But I, I love having you share that because I do think that it likely resonates with a lot of people. So thanks for letting me putting put you on the spot. Okay, so this one's coming from St. Louis, uh, Charlena here. 
Are you seeing more people returning to national conventions and trainings or staying with online options? I ask this because I have been tasked with budgeting this and we would get a lot more of for our money if we engage with online training since there are no travel costs. Looking forward to your responses. This is timely. <laughs> Very timely. I think the challenge with online options is it doesn't allow the person who's taking advantage of the professional development, in my opinion, to really pause and soak it all up and have time to let it sink in and come back to their work. Because as soon as the online session is over, you're back in your work immediately. Um, and a lot of the times the benefit of going to in-person trainings is the networking, the atmosphere, the excitement, the stepping away from work and life to go somewhere new uh, and interact with like-minded people. So, you know, online is commonplace. It'll always be there. Uh, but as we know, in-person is coming back in full swing. Um, so I highly recommend you budget for it. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Fundraising Academy's very own Cultivate Conference coming up on Thursday, June 1st. Uh, take a look at our website uh, and sign up. We've got our early bird pricing right now. I believe it's only $79 for a whole day in San Diego. Uh, Jarrett will be there. I'll be there. Uh, and one of the more famous uh, conferences I'm sure you've heard of is the Association of Fundraising Professionals International Conference, ICON, uh, and that's going to be taking place in New Orleans and such a wonderful conference. Uh, Fundraising Academy will have sessions there uh, and we're present there. So uh, I'm a big fan of in-person and have always seen it as a way for me to um reflect on my career, reflect on my journey, come back to my organization uh, more nourished and stronger and enthused about my work. Uh, so I de definitely would suggest including travel in your budget, including uh, professional development in your budget going forward as much as you can. Yeah. Great plug. I love that. So thank you for both Cultivate for Fundraising Academy at National University in San Diego, June 1, and then also the AFP icon coming up very soon, actually, uh, middle of April in New Orleans. So um, I will be at both of those IRL for a shout out to Julia Patrick in real life. And um, you're so right, Muhi. I, I do think adding this to your budget and what I would recommend, Charlena, is maybe go back to what your budget was five years ago to see how you were investing in these, you know, uh, travel and conference and personal development, maybe go back to those records if you can. And if you don't have access to them, your accounting team absolutely should have access to them to see what was spent maybe on average five years ago. Um, I know I'm looking at a lot of donor uh, information, Muhi, from five years ago because that was pre-pandemic, right? And so I feel like it's very similar, Charlena, if you look back at your travel and what you were uh, providing at that time. The other thing I will add is I have absolutely heard many of these conferences are no longer offering a hybrid option. So I do think that that online and that hybrid option may very well be uh, disappearing in the very near future. I don't think that, you know, there will never be another online conference. I think those will still exist, but I do think that the hybrid is probably starting to disappear and you'll see that more and more as we move move forward into 2024. So uh, good luck. And hey, we hope to see you in San Diego. <laughs> All right. So this one's coming from uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, Jeffrey wants to know about an online auction. So the question is, we are kicking around an idea of doing a mid-season online auction without any event. We would run it and promote it like it was attached to an event, but it would be a standalone. There would be no tickets to access the bidding site, just registering with an email. It would run for two weeks. Any feedback on this? Yeah, I love this opportunity. Uh, it sounds like a low cost effort. It allows you to still have a touch point with your supporters. Um, but 
a few things come to mind. Um, you know, are you going to have people who are primed and ready to bid? Uh, will it be engaging? Have you done this before? Um, just a few things to keep in mind as you maybe are changing what you've done in the past and trying something new. Uh, but it sounds really great. Uh, and hopefully the items that you have are engaging and people will be fighting over them um, and bidding back and forth. And it does really well for you. Yeah. And, and I will add, and I shared this with you uh, before we even open our green room chatter, but my son's school does an online auction. And I've noticed that that has been, you know, uh, very beneficial, or it seems to be very beneficial. I'm not on the planning committee. <laughs> I, I did set that boundary, right? But really looking at it from the engagement piece, because the auction can go to people, um, you know, not just that are, are tied into the school, but it could go to the entire family family unit, right? So extended family members, grandparents, cousins, you know, anyone really to support the school. And I have seen that, you know, really benefit. One of the things that I will say, and I, I laugh every time I see it, but it goes for a lot of money, is a front row parking space. <laughs> And I just think that's hilarious because I know the pressure and the chaos when it comes to school traffic. Um, and so, Jeffrey, as you think of what might be a hot commodity, like I always love experiences, you know, where can I go? What can I do? What can I experience? But also think about for your constituency base that might be immediately local, right? What are some of those opportunities uh, that you could include in this? I agree with you, Muhi. It does not sound like a big heavy lift, um, but what I do think will be, you know, a, a big piece of its success, Jeffrey, would be the marketing communications that goes into this to really stress and share the importance of raising these funds and what it will allow your organization to do. So uh, there is so many online auction events that I think, you know, if you partner with them, they can also... Um, you know, sync or integrate rather into your donor database. So I think this is a great opportunity, but what I will also add as my final point here, Jeffrey, is to track and measure its success, analyze what it does. So you can see if this is something worth adding to your annual fundraising calendar going forward, because I do think that this could be something that you might want to continue, but you might find that it was a total flop and not something that you want to continue, but I think it's worth, I think it's worth, you know, uh, checking it out. So good. Yeah. A few, a few additional thoughts come to mind as well as yeah. like, are the vendors going to be donating any of the proceeds? Are they discounting the items? Are they taking care of shipping? Um, and how would those collected who are winning, uh, is this something that you can maybe even try to do outside of the region of impact nationally, uh, all across the U.S.? Um, so a few things that, you know, could make this a lot more lucrative. Um, but I think that, you know, running it and promoting it like it was an event makes sense. Um, but really allowing yourself to do this as a standalone and not have the pressure of a full on gala as well is a really smart way to um do a mid-year type of online event so kudos and best of luck yeah best of luck and great great additional points there muhi thank you so much again for those of you watching and listening today i've had the great pleasure of having muhi kwaja joining me i always love to say the alphabet behind his name it's mpa cfre and cfrm he serves as a trainer at the Fundraising Academy. And again, Fundraising Academy is with National University. Another shout out to the Cultivate Conference that is coming up uh, June 1. I almost said January at the other J, uh, but June, the, June 1 in San Diego. So uh, we'll be there for that. And again, please check out the American Muslim Community Foundation that Muhi is a co-founder of and still very involved so thank you, Muhi. It's always a pleasure. I know it's uh, nighttime or now it's probably, you know, first thing in the morning for you where you are now, but I hope that you are having a, a wonderful Friday or almost Saturday. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here and can't wait for the next one.
Yeah, thank you. Well, and pleasure to have the support from our ongoing presenting sponsors, which include Fundraising Academy at National University, also Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. Again, these companies, many of them, if not most of them, all of them have been with us from the very, very beginning and so very honored to have the ongoing support. Please check them out. Uh, they are here for you. As I like to say, they're here because their mission is your mission and they want to help you do more good. And speaking of doing more good, we like to end every episode with this mantra that is extremely heartfelt. And we want to remind you, all of you, including ourselves, to please stay well so you can continue to do well. So thanks everyone. And thank you, Muhi, for joining me.